All right, I'm glad to open up our next session of three speakers. Our first speaker is Casey Russell Lodrig from the Tulane National Primate Center, but she's here to talk about the contingency rule and the non-human primate centers uh, throughout the United States. Casey, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'm unmuted as well. Hi. So yes, I'm Casey Russell Lodrig. I'm currently the Associate Director and Chief Veterinary Medical Officer at the Tulane National Primate Research Center. And I'm going to be speaking to you today from the perspective of the large NHP breeding colony and research intensive facility and how we have handled the um, new contingency planning. Uh, let's see if I have control or next slide, please. So like many of you, as an ALAC International Accredited Facility, we've had a disaster plan in place for many years. Uh, implementation of the USDA's new requirement for this contingency planning was not reinventing the wheel for us. So in some ways, it was easier than for other facilities that may not have had extensive disaster plans. Uh, we developed the document, including components of existing TNPRC disaster plans, university continuity of operations plans, as well as several of our animal care SOPs. Uh, so these things already existed. We just had to pull them together to make sure we were meeting the, that framework uh, that was mentioned earlier this morning. Uh, our, our facility is in South Central Louisiana. So as you may expect, and as Louis mentioned this morning, hurricane preparation and response plans have been central to our disaster planning for years. Many of the contingency plan sections that we have have subcomponents that can be used as needed without enacting the entire plan, like electrical outages and HVAC, fa HVAC failure that may occur in conjunction with a hurricane or as standalone events. So when we have these plans, we look at what do we need to address, what can be addressed in large components, and then how can we break that down so that it can be used as needed. Uh, some other things uh, like the pandemic response plan are newer than the hurricane and natural disaster plan. Uh, it was originally targeted towards pandemic influenza and that, that potential uh, rather than COVID. But as you may imagine, the pandemic response plan was expanded and detailed with that experience that we all went through. Um, other things like loss of water uh, may occur during a freeze event or during an expected or unexpected plumbing maintenance and repair issue. Uh, you may have expected plumbing uh, maintenance going on that may lead to unexpected repairs that are necessary. How will you handle this? Is this part of your contingency plan? If it is, you will be very thankful for that when that occurs. Uh, and of course, major challenges associated with every plan include determining when to enact the plan, who needs to be involved and at what level, and how communications will be addressed. Next slide, please. So for some natural disasters like hurricanes or freeze events, there may be advance notice that will allow institutions to enact their plans in stages. Uh, for us, we have certain activities that will be performed X number of days before a potential event, then another set of activities that will occur the next day and the next and so on until the event either occurs or doesn't occur. Because as we know, not every natural disaster that's heading our way actually makes it to us. Uh, the contingency plan that we have calls for a very clearly delineated chain of command, which to us includes planning for communications. So communication occurring at every stage of preparations to make sure all stakeholders are on the same page really makes things easier. It's a little less scary, it's less scattered, and it leads to a smoother enactment of the plan as a whole. Anticipated intensity of the event is one of the things that I think really should be taken into consideration in your contingency plans, uh, particularly when making decisions with potentially far-reaching consequences, such as halting an investigator's research projects, or even potentially euthanizing the animals that are on certain studies or housed in certain types of facilities. Uh, for freezes, you can consider how long will the, how low will the temperature drop to? How long will it remain below freezing? Uh, what types of contingency plans do you have in place? 
to mitigate the effects of that freezing weather whenever you're looking at making these decisions. Uh, for hurricanes, uh, are we talking about a category two hurricane or a category five hurricane? Uh, those that may not have worked through a hurricane before may not realize this, but there are very real and drastic differences, not only in the storm itself, but in the anticipated times for recovery following that storm event. Next slide, please. So I should note some facilities, as we've discussed here a little bit earlier, may have small numbers of animals, small numbers of personnel that care for those animals. And for them, evacuation of the animals and personnel really may be the best option depending on what type of event is occurring. For a facility such as ours that has approximately 5,000 non-human primates, many of which are housed in large outdoor breeding colonies, evacuation is unrealistic. Uh, for facilities such as that, for us, we take the stance that preparation to the extent possible prior to a situation occurring is really the best step. So through the new role for contingency planning, though it did not necessarily change the way we handle a crisis or emergency or disaster situation, it did consolidate our plans into an easy to access document so that when something occurs, everyone knows where to turn to find the next step if it's not already ingrained in them through training and practice and tabletop exercises and all of these other things that were mentioned. Next slide, please. So I want you to imagine if, that if this is the road leading to your facility following a storm and think about how you will have personnel reach the facility to provide care for the animals. Uh, how will food and other supplies reach the facility? How will anything reach that facility? And is that an area that's even safe for your personnel to go to with all of the down power lines? And depending on the storm, levels of water that are covering that road as well. So it's common for IACOOKs and AVs to think of the animal care personnel needed on site to provide continuous care for the animals before, during, and after an event such as this. But as Taylor mentioned earlier this morning, it's critical not to forget the facilities personnel that are also needed on site to perform repairs and to maintain facility operations. Again, look at this picture and look at everything that's going wrong here. There are going to be things that your animal care personnel that are on site to care for the animals are going to need to support them in that, that are going to be provided by your facilities personnel. <clears throat> So animal care and facilities personnel at the TMPRC are considered essential personnel. We have designations for essential personnel that everyone knows ahead of time. Uh, our personnel are split into teams that will either remain on site during a storm or be the relief team that will come in to take over following an event once it is safe to do so. Each team knows their designation in advance so that personal pre uh, preparations can be made because realize that people that are staying on site for an event, be it a freeze event, a weather event, uh, some other occurrence, right? This is part of contingency planning. We don't really know what's going to happen, but if we have a plan in place, even if it's not exact, we can look at making it work. They're going to need to make personal arrangements before they stay at the center for potentially an extended period of time. We also make arrangements with local authorities in advance to allow essential personnel to travel to the center, even if roads are restricted, not the way we see in this picture, but restricted for travel um, through um, police, sheriff's office, that sort of thing. Um, so even if roads are restricted or curfews are in place, we hope that personnel can get in if they are needed. We hope that this will prevent situations like the one Dr. Bradfield shared with us earlier, but we've recognized that not all personnel may be able to get to the facility roads may be impassable. Uh, even if the roads that are directly leading to your facility are not uh, impacted, roads leaving the personnel's homes may be impacted. Uh, so that's another reason to consider having personnel re remain on site if possible. And if you do so, I mean, there are a lot of additional considerations that you need to have besides how you're going to care for the animals. You're going to need supplies on hand to care for the animals. This includes food and medications, potentially enough to last for long periods of time if there is a significant recovery period following whichever event it is. 
uh, care for the facilities. So you're going to need fuel for your generators, uh, backup generators for your backup generators, uh, that such as we have learned, commonly, they need, commonly needed parts for any repairs that may need to be made, um, and care for the people. So if you have personnel staying on site, where are they going to sleep? Are cots available for everyone? Is there safe shelter? Is there somewhere that stays warm when there's a freeze event? Is there somewhere that is away from large windows if you are in a hurricane? How are food and water going to be provided for the personnel that stay on site? If there's not a way to get supplies in, do you have enough supplies on site for however many people may be staying there? Will they be responsible for bringing their own food? Will your facility be providing it? Potable water is a very significant consideration that you have to have ahead of time to make sure you plan for. If a physical or natural disaster occurs concurrently with a public health crisis like COVID, yes, this does happen. How is that handled for personnel that may be living in a facility that was not designed for multiple personnel to be living in it for an extended period? Again, these are all things that can be considered in your contingency plan. And as I mentioned before, and it's true in so many circumstances, and as others have mentioned today already, communication is key, both up and down the chain of command, not only during a crisis, but days, weeks, and months later. I'm sorry, next slide, please. So determining the most important components to include in your contingency plan and gathering feedback regarding feasibility of the implementation is very important. So regular training on the contingency plan components will ensure that all stakeholders understand their roles and who to contact at any given part during implementation of the plan. So a process should be in place to ensure that emergency contact information is reviewed and updated at least annually. If you're in a smaller institution, you may be able to just send out regular reminders to folks, hey, if you move, if you get a new phone number, let us know, let's update our, our records. Um, if someone leaves and someone else takes their place, changing signs around the facility so that everyone knows who to contact for different issues, but at least have something on your calendar, I'd say annually to reach out to the entire facility personnel, especially essential personnel, to get updated contact information. So your personnel need to know how to contact you, everyone up the chain of command at your facility, but you also need to know how to get in contact with them. And during emergency situations, this is not what extension are they at at your institution. This may be what is your the personal phone number, what is a personal email, not a work email. Where are they going to evacuate to if your personnel are evacuating, but you still need to get information to them regarding things that are occurring on site and whether or not they are needed to come back to take over some of the animal care responsibilities. If you're in a situation where normal methods of communication, such as phone and email, are interrupted, uh, things to consider are something like mass automated texts that can go out to personnel on a regular basis since, as Greg mentioned, texts are often still functioning even when phone lines are out. Uh, radios with personnel in key positions may be a good option for on-site communications between one building and another. But remember with radios, they're great, but if you just keep them in a drawer, they may not work. They have to be charged and ready to go, and they have to be tested regularly so that when an emergency occurs, you know that that method of communication is still functioning. Next slide, please. So I believe that having a centralized communication team is really critical in a crisis situation. It allows for a unified, up-to-date message to be relayed to all stakeholders and to the public. Okay, so we review when and how communication should occur with facility, with agencies outside of our facility. So the list here obviously includes things that are not relevant to all of your institutions. Uh, we have Department of Homeland Security and CDC on our list in part because we have one of the US's uh, ABSL3 regional biocontainment laboratories where we perform select agent and other ABSL3 research. Likewise, this is not an all-inclusive list and other local, state, and federal agencies may need to be contacted in certain situations. 
So this is an important part of planning and developing that contingency plan and the communications part of that plan for looking at which of these agencies need to be contacted, what situations they need to be contacted, and then whether or not reach out to them ahead of time, okay? Reach out ahead of time to establish these relationships, whether they have recommendations on other people or, or groups that should be contacted in certain situations. They give great feedback too. And can't state this enough. Do not underestimate the importance of social media in your external communication strategy. During certain situations, your employees may be getting their news and updates from social media when other news outlets and communications are not available. It is not uncommon for people to post updates that are not factual updates at all, confusing employees and the public as to what situations may actually be occurring at your facility. So having a public relations unit or other such team that can generate and post factual updates is very helpful. And having that one section that you can go to with your information and know that they have the authority to disseminate information, that is key, so that every person at the facility is not sending out a different message. One unified message to avoid confusion and to help put people at ease. Next slide, please. So one of the things that it was suggested that we discuss is what plans might look like for interinstitutional agreements. I thought about this one um, because we do not have an evacuation plan for our animals. We have plans for how we are going to maintain them uh, at our facility in these different events. But we have had other institutions reach out to us to use us as their evacuation point for their animals. So if like, what if like us, you do not plan to evacuate your animals, but your facility is part of the contingency plan as an evacuation point for another facility. So discussions regarding feasibility, responsibility, accountability should involve your animal facility care leadership, um, facilities leadership, uh, the attending veterinarian, IACUC members, IACUC leadership, and general counsel for your institution, if you have that, and establish detailed interinstitutional agreements. And doing this prior to the crisis keeps general counsel happy and ensures that both facilities really understand their roles. So if facility A is sending facility B their animals, does facility B already have the personnel and supplies in place to take care of those? Or will facility A be sending personnel and supplies with those animals to continue their care at the new facility? Um, it's great to be able to help each other out. But last minute requests for emergency help while everybody wants to help in those emergencies, sometimes plans just fall through because of lack of planning in the plans, if that makes sense. But not having everything laid out ahead of time and where you're trying to get these plans going on the fly. Transportation is a huge issue between institutions. Um, some institutions will not accept legal liability for other personnel or other animals. So again, getting all of that established with these interinstitutional agreements before a crisis situation occurs is the way you wanna go. Next slide, please. And another really important component that was touched on very briefly this morning, but I think needs to be a big part of your overall plan is planning for an after action review. Um, following enactment of any part of your contingency plan. So check off the things that went right and let your team know what an excellent job they did, right? Because everybody's putting a lot into caring for these animals during really stressful situations, right? Solicit feedback from them about what parts of the plan didn't work. Like this was in the plan that mm, it turns out in reality, that was not the way to go. So why did that part of the plan not work? And what could we do to make it work next time? How can we correct that? Also important, what situations occurred that weren't considered at all in the original plan? In original plan? And 
<clears throat> excuse me, need to be added to improve the outcome of the next adverse event. Uh, for example, access control, right? So if the power is out and you typically have electronic access to buildings or rooms within the buildings um, to allow access for personnel that have met the training requirements, but not allow access for those that haven't, do those locks fail locked or unlocked in a power outage? If, if they fail locked, which personnel have access to physical keys to get into those facilities? Where are those keys kept? If it's actually with a person, is that person one of the essential personnel that is staying on site for these events? Or are they not and the keys at home with them and then you can't get to it? So things to think about ahead of time, right? Uh, if they fail unlocked, how are the facilities adequately secured? So that again, even during this emergency event, you're ensuring that the only personnel entering those areas are those that have been trained to do so. All right, next slide, please. And then these are just a few of the broad categories of mistakes that you should try to avoid when developing your contingency plan, training for your plan and enacting your plan, right? We've already discussed the importance of communication. Knowing who is responsible for which types of communication really ensures that you're not in a situation where everyone thinks someone else has done something already that still needs to be done. Uh, no two crisis or emergency situations are the same. So plans have to have some room for flexibility. And lastly, please consider the human element and what type of toll these situations are taking on your employees and plan accordingly. Whether it's a formal part of your contingency plan or part of your compassion fatigue resiliency program, right? Personnel that are caring for their, these animals during situations involved in our contingency plans, they may feel conflicted regarding euthanasia of animals related to the situation. They may be worried about their families and pets that are at home while they're at work caring for the animals that still need us regardless of what else is going on. They may be concerned about what their jobs are going to look like and how they will continue once the situation is resolved, depending on the extent and severity of the issue. So I really urge you to address these concerns proactively when you can. Next slide, please. And though I wanted to kind of end on that last slide, uh, we were also asked for suggestions for clarification for, for the contingency plan. And, and these are kind of just the things that I see. So there's currently a couple of broad areas and a couple of vague areas. And I understand really why both exist, but a little more clarification would be beneficial. So it's understandable that every potential situation cannot be listed in the AWA, right? Since different areas of the country are prone to different natural disasters. However, will VMOs accept the most likely listings that each facility comes up with, what they feel is most likely, or will they issue citations for not including all situations that the licensee might experience? This is, this is the wording that is currently in there. So it was mentioned in this morning session that there were some comments from the surveys regarding lack of consistency with, between VMOs and their interpretations. So I'd say one of my questions is just how would this be addressed and what type of clarification could we have for that? And then that closes out my part of this session. Thank you very much. Casey, thank you very, very much. Um, our next speaker is Dean Oliver Garden. Uh, well, he is the Dean of the LSU Veterinary School. He's really here to talk about complex institutions working with the Contingency Act. So, Dr. Garden. Thank you very much, Dr. Landy. It's a real pleasure to be here. I really am representing a large complex academic institution, but I think many of the features of the institution are relevant across different sectors. And I'm just gonna try and X out, there we are. I had a, a, a real rude awakening two days after I moved to Louisiana three years ago was Hurricane Ida. So I certainly saw firsthand how we as an institution navigate uh, at least natural disasters. And I was uh, so impressed by what I saw because it represented the best of a community coming together. And what I'd like to do is to represent my segment of this discussion in these uh, parts. First of all, to give you an impression about what the institution does and, and, and the breadth and depth of, of us, all of our stakeholder groups, including students, staff, faculty, and indeed alumni too, 
Then to give you an impression of the sort of disaster scenarios that we face in South Louisiana, and they've already somewhat been mentioned by the previous speaker who's an alumna of ours, yay. Uh, then to speak about preparedness and how we uh, navigate our responses, our thoughts on the contingency rule, and then uh, next steps. And the next steps were just thoughts of my own. Hopefully uh, some of that will be relevant. So the institution is based upon the main campus, the A&M campus. We have a large multi-species vivarium that's managed by our director of the Division of Lab Animal Medicine, Dr. Rhett Stout. He's an alumnus of ours. You'll probably all be familiar with him. And we are now recruiting, after a bit of a hiatus, an assistant director, and, uh, and that's very exciting. But I want to acknowledge and thank, in a heartfelt way, Rhett for, for both his help in preparing this talk, but also in general for his Herculean efforts on a daily basis on the LSU campus. We also look after animals in the life sciences building on the main campus, that's in uh, a smaller, but nevertheless important vivarium at a different location about a mile away from the veterinary school. So we have uh, four key functions. We teach, we heal, we discover, namely research, and we protect. And the diversity of what we do is germane to our disaster planning because it involves multiple different stakeholders, an evolving workforce and group of individuals on the campus. And there can be upwards of a thousand people on the campus at any, any one time during the school uh, year when it's busiest. And it involves educating all of those different stakeholders in the context of uh, disaster planning. I would say that we're the very happy benefactors of a central office of emergency planning and preparedness. And they do an excellent job of community-wide, namely campus and system-wide communication of impending at least natural disasters. We've had our fair share of human intrusion as well and, and threats. So I'll mention those as I go along in addition. Teaching is the, the primary role of the vet school. We now are admitting 176, next year 200 students per cohort, and, and we've just graduated a smaller class size of 109, we're growing, and all of those have exposure to uh, emergency planning. It would be very unusual in their four years for them not to experience a weather event at the very minimum, whether it's a tornado that we had literally just a few weeks ago, or a hurricane, and this hurricane season looks to be uh, as though we'll be faced with several of them or other, other events, flooding and, and such like. So, so we're very well prepared as a community for this and they are inculcated in the basics of emergency planning from the day they enter our vet school. We also do on the bottom right have a vibrant and growing graduate student population. These are not veterinarians, these in the most part, some of them are, but many of them are our biomedical scientists who are doing masters or PhDs. And we do have a few dual degree DVM, MS, DVM, MPH, and DVM, PhD degree students, but the ever evolving nature of that student body creates some challenges and opportunities for disaster planning. And they are all uh, certainly graduate, very familiar with the, the basic tenets of disaster planning and, and uh, the principles of the contingency rules. We not only manage our research animals for the whole campus, but we also have a very large clinical enterprise and we run the state diagnostic lab. We are the only vet school in Louisiana. So we have an outpatient clinic. We do lots of outreach, including a shelter medicine program, a veterinary low and no cost outreach uh, program as well, going into underserved uh, populations. We deal with the living mascot, Mike the tiger, who is in the enclosure. It's, it's a beautiful enclosure on the main campus and we are indeed the vets who look after that. Rhett is the, Rhett Dr. Rhett Stout is the vet who looks after that and we have two students who are who are caretakers of Mike for two years and they, they have obviously no days off so they have to work very well together and, and he, the tiger, creates some challenges as well in the case of, of weather events. We also serve Louisiana's uh, $2.5 billion animal agricultural industry, and we have large animals both on site and uh, tended for by our ambulatory clinics. We also run the state diagnostic lab, and part of that is monitoring for at least biosecurity risks and 
For example, during the pandemic, we did most, at least initially, most of the SARS-CoV-2 testing. We are clear accredited in our diagnostic operations. So we not only test for animal diseases, including transboundary and exotic diseases, but, and we have two, three actually on campus. One of them is in the diagnostic lab, three biosafety level three labs, but we also do human testing as well. And we are expanding our human uh, testing capability. We look after and release wildlife, injured wildlife that has been uh, stricken by either human or, or natural uh, disasters of their own. And every month we probably release a raptor, usually bald eagle, but we deal with all of Louisiana's wildlife uh, other than those, uh, other than primates and raccoons, rabies carrying uh, mammals. Otherwise we deal with them and we have a great uh, response rate. We do, in our protection function, do we, we, we engage in statewide responses. And so we do training, and this is an example on the top right of a picture showing training in action. We have expertise in disaster responses and in rescuing animals that have been subject to natural and other disasters. And every year we do training for that. And I'll just mention that in a, in a few moments. We have a very uh, large research portfolio, all the way from basic biomedical research to translational and veterinary, and we do everything in between. And one of the unique challenges, also an opportunity of our research is the breadth and depth of species that we deal with. And they include uh, everything from rodents, as you might imagine, all the way to large animals. And I'll, I'll just explain that in a second. But we have uh, research that spans uh, pathogen research, lung biology disease, cancer, uh, infectious disease, and viral agents. And we have, as I say, two research and one diagnostic BSL-3 lab, as well as some of our clinical veterinary uh, research in equine health and sports performance and in small animals and a vibrant wildlife health uh, research program as well. These are the animals that we deal with, uh, all the way from amphibians, reptiles, fish, rodents, birds, uh, small animals, cats, dogs, uh, guinea pigs, rabbits, cattle, goats, sheep, and horses. And the approximate number at any one time are shown on the right-hand column. And as I say, they are spread between our main vivarium at the vet school, which is growing, and the vivarium in the life sciences building on main campus. And the contingency rule certainly was relevant, but we were already... Uh, prepared because all of our disaster preparedness was dictated by our animal welfare assurance statement of assurance. Uh, we treat everything as though it's governed by the Off Office of Lab Animal Welfare and we are ALAC accredited. We have been for many years, although clearly some of our species are, are covered by USDA and the Animal Welfare Act, but we were already managing the whole portfolio of species according to the highest, the most stringent rules in place. And so all of the contingency rule stipulations, we were pretty much already navigating when they were uh, introduced in 2022. We face numerous disaster scenarios and we are in lockstep with the main campus. There is a tabletop exercise every single year. The Office of Emergency Planning organizes this and we uh, play our role in all of our different units. Of course, the animal uh, research the vivariums is one, but it also includes our clinical enterprise, our diagnostic labs, and, um, and other aspects of what we do, and our teaching, for example. And we view the disasters in the usual ways, looking at vulnerabilities imposed by hazards or more specific targeted threats. And we look at exposure likelihood versus impact and try to categorize each of these vulnerabilities as low, medium, or high in their overall uh, overall risk. And we do have, and I have it actually in my bag, standard operating procedures and emergency action checklist for typical scenarios. It isn't six inches deep, I'm happy to say. It is very much principle driven. And every last person in the animal unit is introduced to this uh, guide and the general principles of disaster management within, well, two weeks of, of them uh, having uh, becoming employed by us. In addition to that, all of our principal investigators, all of our veterinary staff working in the hospital 
And all of our students are also uh, ingrained in the general principles of disaster management so that we can navigate them in, a, in an adept uh, fashion that's fit for purpose as, as disasters strike. And we, we look at them in two general categories, meteorological. So we regularly, well, not so much now anymore, but we have in the past had flooding. Certainly hurricanes are a not unusual occurrence, usually two to three per year. In the last two years, we haven't had any, but in my first year, we certainly had a few. Tornadoes, we had one of those uh, about a month ago, a few weeks ago, and that uh, led to some damage on main campus, but an end of our uh, staff and faculty's houses, personal houses, but, but not on the, the vet school campus itself. But then of course, there are others that are typically, uh, we encounter a, on a few occasions a year, animal releases, hopefully uh, not uh, by accident, uh, a fire, a hazardous chemical spills, human intrusion. We haven't had too many of those. We do monitor the activity of uh, animal rights groups, as you might imagine, quite uh, stringently. The pandemic had an impact. We had to euthanize many of our animals, but we obviously kept some uh, germ lines alive and, and preserved and power outages do occur. We do on the main campus, on our vet school campus, we have four generators that will keep one there full of fuel. One is a kerosene, two of kerosene, two of natural gas. They will allow our, our whole operation to remain viable for four days before they need refueling. And we usually have about two weeks worth of fuel uh, on hand. The uh, life sciences building is less well, uh, it's a bit of an older building and it's, it's less well, um, adapted to that need, but, but we have managed power outages uh, in that scenario. We have portable generators for Mike the Tiger's enclosure if, if there were a need, for example, to provide a air conditioning in, in that scenario. We are also pulled in different directions. It's not only our research enterprise, but we are also uh, very much involved in state uh, emergency responses uh, for animals, large and small, that are the, the, the unhappy uh, subjects of natural disasters like flooding and, and, tornado and, um, and hurricanes. And we have done our part in that and we have a, an expertise in those specific scenarios. So we had a, a rude awakening in 2005. Obviously there was the, the major hurricane Katrina and that led to a lot of focus on how we manage large natural disasters. And we played a big role in that, especially in uh, rehoming hundreds of small animals. And that really uh, led to some uh, very profound outcomes for the better. And in general, we tend to default to the most stringent regulations. We have three in place, uh, USDA, NIH, and ALAC, uh, but we basically uh, streamline everything down to one. And that's probably more stringent than the contingency rules. And this avoids confusion and enables us to be nimble if there are changes in the less stringent rules in place. Uh, we've always had animal wealth, the animal welfare assurance, and we basically uh, follow the guide in our emergency preparedness and planning. And as I say, we do tabletop exercises at the vet school, but also on the main campus every year and we have our fair share of training on the job, if you will, by virtue of the disasters that we face pretty much on a yearly basis. So we, we have in the moment training as well as, as, well as scenario uh, exercises. And we, we obviously undergo, uh, we, we look at our disasters through the emergency man management cycle in terms of mitigating their impact, preparing ourselves, for example, stockpiling uh, animal bedding, uh, food, Etc. for at least uh, one, if not two weeks, responding in an agile fashion that is principle-based rather than minutiae or, or, or specific scenario-based, although we do have templates for particular scenarios that occur most commonly like hurricanes and flooding, recovery efforts, and then prevention to, uh, to learn from previous experiences and to do things better the next time round. We also do collaborate closely with statewide networks, including uh, most prominently the Louisiana State Animal Response Team. And I'd just like to say a few words about that. That was developed from Louisiana Veterinary Medical Association Disaster Committee. It was uh, really uh, prompted and, and uh, accelerated by Hurricane Katrina. 
and it's a division of the Walter J. Ernst Memorial Foundation, and the director is one of our alumna, Dr. René Purier. She works very closely with our faculty and staff, and there is a very distinct communication tree, both within house and also across our campus, in terms of preparing for disasters and who is going to communicate with whom. And there are designated uh, individuals who have the authority to make key decisions. Obviously, I'm one of them. And we also do training both in-house and out-of-house. And we have uh, students, veterinarians, vet techs, firefighters, and animal uh, cruelty association personnel from all over the state and further afield. We had last year, for example, quite a number of veterinarians from Puerto Rico. And this disaster training and response boot camp, which is once a year, it was held at our campus about two months ago, is led by Dr. Musajab Mirza, who is a large animal surgeon, an equine surgeon and, uh, and emergency and critical care specialist who has particular expertise in animal disaster and rescue efforts. And also uh, humans as well, who usually are stranded with their animals. They rarely are willing to part with them and the picture on the right is one of our equine surgeons, Dr. Laura Riggs, uh, leading a horse away from, uh, away from flooded uh, fields. We use multimodal training methods, including real animals, but also obviously models and either low or high fidelity. And the same uh, is true of our uh, research enterprise. We train all of our technicians and staff, and there's a very distinct communication tree. What we tend to do is we have teams, as the previous speakers have mentioned, ride out teams who literally live in shelter in place and live in the hospital or live in the animal house in the vivarium uh, for one, two, sometimes three days. And then we have aftermath relief teams who take on the job of bringing things back to norm normalcy after the event. But we've, we've exercised this multiple times and we've also thought of other contingencies such as, for example, folks who have pets. We have uh, no animals on, uh, on campus. We have no animals on campus rule unless, of course, they're, they're um, working animals, uh, you know, ADA animals or, or patients in our hospitals. But we uh, relax those completely in the sake, in the, in, the, in the context of disasters and we allow people to bring their animals in and indeed in some cases other family members to shelter in the safety of our building. Some of our students, for example, have family members whose houses are not resistant to some of the natural disasters that we face. So we adopted the contingency rule by default. The verbiage we feel is clear and unambiguous. Soliciting opinions from our stakeholders, Dr. Stout and his team, one of the challenges that we uh, identified was in 2.102 in the holding facilities, in, including the premise that they would be included in our contingency plan or have one of their own. And obviously we have a certain venues that we would look to as a site in the case of disaster. But if those are full, then we feel that there may be a need for more flexibility in case we need to invoke secondary facilities who may not be included in our plan or indeed have one of their own. But in most cases, we would not be in a position to evacuate animals. They would all shelter in place and we would have to navigate them on site, uh, especially the large animals. It, it, it creates particular challenges moving them. And Mike the tiger certainly wouldn't be movable. He would be remaining in his enclosure. It is exceedingly robust. And, uh, and you know we've navigated several, several hurricanes with that facility in place. We do have specific needs that are relevant to the university research enterprise. And one of them is biosecurity risks in moving animals in or out. We do quite a bit of uh, BSL-3 work. So there are pathogen risks in moving animals and we have critical resources that we would be bereft not to preserve. And some species wouldn't be adaptable to moves. Uh, you know, Dogs, cats, and so on are maybe fairly uh, resilient and robust, but fish, frogs, snakes, and birds, not so much. And recently we had a power outage in the life sciences vivarium. And uh, much as we try to regulate temperature in all of the usual ways, 
some of our very delicate frogs who are exceedingly sensitive to even small fluctuations in temperature sadly uh, perished uh, in that context, but very few of them, thankfully, before we get, got uh, on that uh, disaster. So next steps we believe are obviously collation of the survey data, both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, I'd be very interested in seeing the workshop commentary and feedback at the end of two days. I think this is a living document. It is. It should be subject to continuous improvement and reiteration. It clearly should align with the Animal Welfare Assurance uh, of PHS and the NIH. And I think there's a need for training courses. I think the National Academies could play a role there. And going forward, I think there may be a, a utility in conceiving of a disaster planning consortium. And we at LSU Vet Med would be very proud and pleased to participate in that should that be um, uh, deemed desirable. So that was my uh, presentation. And uh, as I say, thank you very much. We, we, um, we're very proud and pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Garden. Our final speaker uh, of the six speakers is Charles Benson, who's, uh, excuse my pun, a horse of a different color. I mean, he is going to be speaking on topics that I don't think many of us here, at least I do not have a lot of experience with. I had to look up um, IOT, which is the Internet of Things. So I'm very interested in learning more about his experience and his advice for us. Mr. Benson. Okay, thank you. And can I get slide control from here? Somebody else will have to answer that question. He has it. You have it, I've been told. I I, I apologize. Where do I... Uh... Well, let me try this. You click on the slide to move it, I've been told. All right, I'm doing that, and it's not moving. Uh, oh, oh, there we go. Okay. All right. <laughs> now I want to go back, but um, that's, that's okay. So, yeah, we will talk. Thanks for, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to have this, to have this discussion, because it, it is a thing that's not or historically hasn't been thought about much and it's changed so fast and it's changing rapidly. And these new technologies are really showing themselves in, in, in research areas and in particular uh, animal research areas. So we'll go through an overview of what an IOT system is and the internet of things systems. We'll talk about how these systems, uh, multiple systems are interconnected and the issues that creates. We'll go through a cyber, tech, uh, cyber attack example, uh, touch on IOT supply chain issues, Talk about vendor considerations and the skill the skill set shortage of uh, people and uh, crews that can do IoT o operational technology and IT, and we'll all, then we'll talk about some risk mitigation points. So for for our purposes, that we you'll hear IoT for Internet of Things or operational technology. For our purposes, we don't have to distinguish them too much. Uh, the way I see it is. OT or operational technology are the more traditional systems like uh, HVAC, lighting controls, industrial automation. And IoT is a superset of that that, that can include those things, but also some consumer technologies like Alexa or Nest, and also technologies that we'll find in that we find in labs. So animal research labs and facilities gen generally have at least some of these. Uh, there's there's interest in automation, there's a broader array of sensing. Uh, traditional HVAC systems are there. As certainly, I mean, this, this was there before, but certainly since the pandemic, uh, uh, remote monitoring and management, the demand for that is way up and that requires technologies to, to do that. Uh, possibly remote control, we want reporting, we wanna get some data out of all these sensors that we, that we have deployed across the lab. And also within the lab, of course, is uh, intellectual property, sensitive subjects, or certainly animals in this case, uh, other products. It could be all of the above. So there's a lot of these kinds of IoT and OT systems that are in research labs, and we're only going to see more. So some examples in, the, in these settings would be, uh, say, pressure monitoring and control, temperature monitoring and control, uh, air quality sensing, like, say, uh, ammonia particulate in the in the air and in animal areas, pH monitoring, cage washers, watering systems, and feeding systems, uh, light sensing and controls, and, and many others. So there's just, again, there's a, a lot of these in these labs. So I'll give an example of a cyber tech, and this was at the end of last year, and there was a, 
a nation state that was it's, it was a it was a political thing, and this is a nation state actor, and they were going after a company that was Israeli owned. It was an Israeli company, and that's why they're going after them. And one of the things this group, this company made was something called a PLC or programmable logic controller, and that's that's used in um, in uh, in facilities where 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 you're moving and controlling large amounts of water or wastewater. Well, also what happens is some labs uh, uh, have large aquariums that use these kinds of systems. And there's at least one case where a lab got caught up in the attack and there was substantial, had a su substantial impact. So that's, and that's, that was at the end of last year. And I mean, I'm not trying to be, you know, when we talk about this stuff, we don't want to be gloom and doom, but we also want to paint the picture that 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 it's that it's real and this stuff is really out there, and we we have to find ways to think about it and prepare for it. So here's another an, another example. This is one I came across a few years ago, and I'll say, uh, don't don't do this at home because this but this was my this was uh, this was my job to do this. But one of the things I was doing in an area of interest that I had. I was using a public tool, a publicly available tool called Showdown, and which anybody can go use uh, to look for exposures, to look for exposures in this area that I had an interest in. And so we're just using a couple, you know, quick commands. Again, this is a public tool with directions, support. It's not, you know, hacking trickery or, or anything. It's just a tool. And I was able to find um, some, uh, an iris controller. Uh, somewhere in my area of interest that I'm mean, not, not not a controller, but a uh, iris identi identification. And so I, I I saw it. I saw the IP address. I put that in to to see what popped up. And again, this is not um, you don't want to do this unless you're authorized to do it within your environment because uh, people can see this as being uh, malicious behavior. Anyway, uh, I I put that address in. This popped up. This open. So from here, I can see, uh, I can see the company. And by the way, this is not a knock on the on the on this particular company, but it's talking about how these things get implemented. Uh, so this came up. I see the name of the company. I go to Google, and I I saw the name of the company in the in the device, and it said, uh, you know, it's ICAM seven thousand. So I just typed into Google ICAM space seven thousand space default space password. I hit return and what first thing that pops up is in this search you know, there's a little overview there and if you look down in the text you can see and I don't even have to click on the link you can see in there that it's saying the default what the default password is and the default login is and again this is not this is not hacking this is just looking stuff up and then I went through and uh, and I entered it again just to see what would happen and this because I'm trying to find exposure, you know. And sure enough, I'm in. Like I'm I'm fully in. So I, I was able to go use a default uh username and password. And now I'm into this system that's protecting something. And the fact that it's that someone has invested in this uh an iris scanner as their protection mechanism, I'm gonna guess that there was some something sensitive behind this, behind what it was protecting. So anyway. Now at this point I'm into the system. I've got full. I can, I can do just about anything in there. You can see on the right, well, on the right and the left, the things that I can control, that I should not be able to control. And by the way, I don't make any changes there. I just look to see what could be controlled. Uh, so how, so how the whole system gets configured, what server it's talking to, like it's all there, and that I shouldn't be able to see that, or anybody else. All right, so let's shift for a minute. And in these IoT systems, these Internet of Things systems, uh, there, there's a data pipeline. And that data pipeline helps to, excuse me for a second, the data pipeline helps to kind of map out uh, what other what, what other systems look like. And that can that can show you the, the data flow of what parts of the system has to be talking to another part of the system. And it's also, it's a way of finding out um, what can fail, what can fail and or what can be attacked. Uh, so most IoT systems, if we start from, oh, oh we also call this, um, a colleague of mine and I developed this about eight years ago when we were working on energy management systems. We find ourselves, we found ourselves kept writing kind of the same diagram on the board 
um, so we, and it's got a, the diagram's got a little flare on one side and a little flare on the other side. So we started calling it the, the jazz hands diagram. But if we start on the left-hand side, we could have a picture of a bunch of meters or, or sensors. These could be uh, air particulate sensors, could be temperature sensors. In this case, it was uh, energy sensors. Then moving to the right, there's a, a, a server or a service that will aggregate all that data. What that server server does, it's good at talking to the, it knows how to talk to these sensors. It'll aggregate that data, compile the data, and then start sending, sending it off as we move to the middle of that screen for a, a lot of data management things. And, and traditional, I mean, there's, there's data management things that have to be uh, done here that you got to manage it, you got to store it, you got to back it up, you got to have access control, you got to have version control, you can have quality management. So all that stuff occurs here too. And as we keep moving to the right, there's going to be some kind of analytics to get something out of this. We're going to run, you know, uh, Tableau on it. it, might be an AI app of some kind. Uh, and we're going to, and out of this, we're going to have multiple kinds of outputs. So some of them are, um, you know, reporting, exports, you know, visualizations and dashboards. And some of them are, and there's different uses for those things. Some of them is regulatory compliance, but you have to show that you're doing things every month or, or quarterly. Uh, there's there's research pieces, there's operational pieces. How, how is my system working? You know, there could be marketing and PR pieces. So most IoT systems look kind of like this. You got a bunch of sensors on one end and a bunch could be, you know, five, 10, a hundred, a thousand. So it's and up. So it's it's a lot of stuff in a single system. So uh, we're gonna talk about system interdependencies for a, a couple of minutes. So if you look at the, that, that picture we are just looking at is the, that screenshot, that piece on the left and the subsequent uh, slides, that's gonna be represented by that little kind of icon slide on the right. So when we, when we have a system, some systems will talk to other systems, like the uh, lighting control um, may want to talk to, um, uh, we may have some automation that involves lighting control, for example. So you could have one system, again, with all those endpoints, and another system of all their endpoints, and they're going to be talking to each other in some way, because you want that happen, because you want to make optimum use of the two systems. Well, now that creates a link, that creates a dependency between the two of them. And that link has got to be maintained. That link is over a network, over an IT network. And it has, to, it has to keep running to get that functionality out of these two systems that have been combined. And, there, and there's work to that. That's, that's not free. Someone's maintaining the, the network. Someone's doing uh, firewalls. Someone's making sure that the hardware that supports the network is in good, in good shape. You know, there's help desks that are running. So that, that connection is not free. And, this, and none of this is to say don't do it, but it's just saying that as we add these things, we, we increase exposure. All right, so that's two systems. And we got, we got one connection that's between them. So let's, let's add a third system that might be talking to each other. So we've got each of those systems with, with their own purposes. Again, maybe a temperature sensing system, a, a pressure sensing system, uh, maybe an air particulate sensing system, and they've got reason to talk to each other, to share information, to get more value out of the operation. And as we do that, we create more interdependencies. So now we have three systems and we've got three interdependencies. And again, those interdependencies are not free. It takes work to keep those going. And it and it creates exposure along the way. So let's do it one more time and add a, another one. So now we've got six. We added a fourth system and now we've got six uh, connections between them. So this, and and notice too, as we add another system in this kind of diagram, the number of interconnections grows faster than the number of systems themselves. So that number of interconnections, it kind of sneaks up on us. And again, those each of those interconnections is a point of exposure. Again, not saying don't do it, but it's, we want to be aware of the risks that, we, that we're seeing. Same thing. So all these, so now we have these interconnected systems. And again, there's, there's a lot of these because these systems can, if they're implemented well and coordinated well, they can add a lot of value to a research environment. And they can also create a lot of exposure if they're not well implemented. So all these are points of fa failure, but they're also attack points. So there are places where a malicious actor could come in and break that and disrupt your, and disrupt your business. And if they break it badly enough, they could really disrupt your business. But these are points of exposure that we have with these with these new technologies and these new systems. 
something we'll talk about just a little bit in a minute is that we're again I'm not and I'm not trying to be gloom and doom but we're we're kind of not that good at it right now because some stuff's IT some stuff's IoT and these two groups don't talk to each other that much often uh, so we we've got this growing exposure so and it calls to the question can we manage what we own the number of things the number of those devices and sensors that are all little network computers is growing rapidly and our ability to manage that is not keeping up. So every, so we've already got issues and every day we add more stuff and usually usually the ability to manage that stuff is not keeping up. So that's, that's a thing that we care about. It, can we manage what we own? It takes the, there's, there's skill sets to manage this stuff. It takes time, it takes staffing, um, it takes funding. And then, the, as we talked before, those interconnections, those blue lines in the previous diagram, that those take resources also. Someone's got to keep that that working, and it's 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 requires resources, and it's coming from a from a finite pool. Supply chain risk. I'm just going to touch on this real quickly. So each of those devices, each of those sensors, it's a network. It's, it's a um, it's a device that interacts with the with the environment some way, either sensing or moving something. Uh, it's it computes has compute, computing power and it's networked. And within each one of those, in that little tiny computer that's doing the sensing, for example, there's multiple pieces of software in there, and those pieces of software could come from different places, because when someone's making something, they might have a special sensor, so they have special sensor with special software that talks to their sensor. Well, there's other pieces that are needed in here too. There might be encryption that's needed. It might be um, software that allows wireless uh, activity. There might be probably almost guaranteed is software that allows you to connect to a little tiny web browser. So these companies, they will go buy these different chunks of software from different people because they won't, for the most part, or often, let me say often, they won't develop the whole thing internally because uh, they, they're going to, they might buy something from someone that makes a you know, web service, web software for tiny, for little devices, just because it's cheaper and more uh, cost effective for them. But what happens you, you, in a device, you end up having uh, components, uh, software components that come from a number of different places. And those places could have outsourced their work. So we end up having these things that we, we're not really sure where it came from. So that's that's a supply chain, supply chain risk that we deal with. And again, and we're putting these each of these little network computers in by the tens, hundreds, thousands, or more. You know, we're bringing them into our environment. Uh, the as I, I animated before, the groups, the this IoT group with people that have skill sets there, and then there's a traditional IT, and they're usually not the same. So there's and if to find a a person or people or a team that could do both is that they're in high demand because there's a lot of this stuff going on across the uh, the country and the world. And it's not just you know, uh, research areas. This is going on in, uh, you know, in critical inf infrastructure also. But those skill sets and those teams that could do both, that could speak IT-ish language and IoT-ish language, they're in high demand. So we, we have this shortage, which I actually believe just broadly is a national security issue. Because we're we're building out so quickly, and this the skill sets I mean they're they're growing, but not as fast as we're as we're building out. And also another thing on the say on the uh, say so you have facilities operators that are uh, used to doing uh, traditional HVAC, for example, and you have traditional IT. That culturally they're they're very different, and even when you got groups that really want to work together and get along, it's still hard. And you don't you know as we all know sometimes that doesn't you're not lucky to have that. But they just the, the way they view the world is different, and it, and using the same language. So so doing things to get these groups together is work and things we want to do sooner than later. So one of the things we've done where where I work, or just as an example, we have a we have an IoT and OT system support meeting between our facilities group and our central IT group, and we do this we do this monthly to go over issues and do some strategic planning. 
We do the same thing regarding the network. We have networks that are made for built environments and we have a, a coordination meeting about that. Like what's getting put on the network? What's it doing? Uh, how's it being operated? Are we, are we talking to each other? There's another one for, we have a big push on energy monitoring and, and management here in uh, Seattle. So we have a, actually it's a bi-weekly meeting on that. We're deploying thousands of sensors across campus to address energy code. So we have a, we have a, a, a twice a month meeting on that one. And there's another one we started a few years ago with a smart campus advisory committee, where we bring in people from multiple groups, from uh, leadership, from facilities, leadership, from central IT. We have information security leadership there. We have some risk management uh, leadership there. But we bring that, that group in uh, to meet also either every two weeks or monthly. So the, these are, and there's still plenty more work to do, but these are examples of some of the things to come together where we get people to start to work on things together and start to develop some of their own language. I mean, not their, not their own language, but to have the uh, the jargon for the two worlds kind of intermix and people can uh, have better communication. That's what we just talked about. Okay. Um, IoT and OT vendor relationships. When I started working, in, I ran an IT group of facilities uh, about a decade and something ago. And when I first got there, I remember I was getting frustrated with all the vendors. Like, oh man, you're just you're just deploying stuff on my network. I don't know what it is. I don't know what's installed. I don't know, you know, what it's doing. I can't even find it. But it, yeah, it took me about six, 12 months to realize, well, we weren't asking them to do anything different. We we weren't we weren't setting the bar. We were saying, I, I need this, and they would deliver it. And they'd come turn, turn it on, make sure the, the green light came on, and it was done. What we want to do, we want to raise the bar with the vendors. We we want to set expectations and, and hold them to that. And this is not anti-vendor sentiment because we we need them. But we we want to raise that bar. We want, we want good IoT and OT vendors. We want good relationships with those vendors. And we want to detect bad IoT and OT vendors quickly. And there are some... There's a lot of good ones and there are some crummy ones out there because this world is so fast. They'll, they'll come in, you know, this wheeling and dealing and talk about all the fancy dashboards and you just, you want to get to a place where you could pick those out and just you know, send them out the door soon so you can work with your, your good relationships. This picture, by the way, is this uh, something I took in a facility. It was in a closet and it was on a new installation. And, and again, this is not knocking this, this, provider either. It's the way it got deployed. But it's so it's a lighting control system and it's in a life sciences area. And I could get to it and I shouldn't have been able to get to it. And you can see what's at the top. You can guess what PW is. It's a password and it's one, two, three, four. So you have a, a sensitive system that got deployed this way and the password is, you know, here you are. So this kind of thing happens, and this we and we want to get things in place where we minimize this kind of thing. Yes, we want to talk. We want to state we, what's what happens in procurement, and what does a successful implementation look like. Oh, another thing with vendors when they do support, they're to remote support. They're to our our networks get intermingled then. So the people that we connect to on the outside that are that we want to come help support the systems that they provided, when that happens, the networks start to get intermingled. And there, there's ways of minimizing that, but oftentimes, we, but let me restate that, but we have to be on top of that to make sure it happens. Um, so we start to, you start to share their network and they start to share your network. And this, and this is, gets back to selecting the vendors we want to work with, because if they've got some bad habits they don't have good cyber hygiene if they don't if they don't act and play well on their network well now your network's exposed um, so that that's those are things we want to be paying attention to also uh just as as an example we set up a what we call an iot writer so with central procurement there's this writer that goes on if an iot system is purchased it says the vendor will do at a minimum these things and they're they're not unreasonable things it's like the vendor will change the default username and password so we don't have that iris situation that we just talked about before it's going to tell me where you installed it what the address was what the version number is what the firmware version number is what the model is uh we even ask them we, to, to take a picture of the installation so we could store that we could see where things got installed so you know when you're 
installing things by the hundreds or thousands in remote places of buildings and labs, things get lost. So we 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 want to do things to minimize that. Okay, so it, it's it's a lot, but what are some actionable things you can do in the near term? One of them is what IoT systems do you have? What do you have? What what cage washers and uh, uh, feeders do you have? What pressure sensors do you have? What how does that interact? How does that connect to the uh, to HVAC? Like just start to you know, write those out. Like what what do you have? Where are those endpoints deployed, and and then who's the vendor? Uh, is that is that vendor contract active? Because you know we've, it's not a, it's it happens where something gets installed and the vendor goes out of business or the vendor leaves or a or vendor gets bought. So who, with these IoT systems, who are your vendors, and are those contracts active, and reviewed? And with uh, and then then similar on the IT side, what are those IT uh, uh, provider? relationships like they should have something called service level service level agreements and how quickly they'll respond to outages and different issues you want to make sure those are current and even if it's provided by your institutionally like by your central it you want to like review that sla and have that and just check on that relationship you don't want to be building it during a crisis uh, you know you want to have something going on beforehand and make sure we're all on the same page uh, you'll also look at, uh, is, is your software current? Has it been updated recently? Because software always has to be, be updated. Uh, another piece, I, I know y'all are uh, talking about it already with tabletops. Tabletops are key for this stuff. Uh, we do a lot here. We're going to be doing a lot more here because it really helps to expose um, issues and assumptions and things we didn't even know. Uh, training and awareness, encryption, there's something called network segmentation. There's a whole a lot of things we can do if the but to start what i would suggest find out what you have find out what you have and where it is and who supports it and that's a great start and it's oh, oh one more thing i'm sorry um and an overarching thing that we we do here is i i've created this four pillar approach to how we mitigate uh risk mitigation around this i don't, I don't know what that is I think it's on the provider computer. Um, I, yeah, thanks. So we have a, we're trying to a, approach it with policy, uh, outreach, education, and assistance, uh, self-awareness and threat awareness. What stuff do we have and who's trying to get us and what kinds of things are they trying to get? Then a lot of that interorganizational coordination that we're talking about. All right, that's and that's it for that's it for me. Well, thank you, Mr. Benson. And that takes us to our panel discussion. We'll have about 30 minutes. Um, people, please put questions on Slido. I think the information's been sent out a couple of times. Um, and Carrie and I are going to be co-moderating this session. And some of the questions that come through are for specific speakers and others are more general. But the first one happens to be for John and it was tied to his principle number six, which um, maybe you could remind us of, but the statement was principle number six, make arrangements with other local animal research facilities that may be able to provide feed, other resources, perhaps even animal care personnel to help out during the initial stages of an, the emergency or disaster. John? Yeah, thank you. I, I appreciate that comment. It's a good one. Uh, I had to remind myself what number six was, but that's planning versus plans. Um, I also think it's tied to number five, which is forget plan A. And I think this comment is relevant uh, to both. Should you do the things suggested by the comment, you know, establish ahead of time interinstitutional agreements for sharing feed, resources, staff, personnel, space. Um, and and I've done that, and it can work very well. So that is that is a plan to have a contingency to be able to share or even move animals. I've also had that fail. Um, I've been guilty of okay. I had an interinstitutional agreement with another place to house animals. The need came. We approached the other institution. Said, hey, we had a handshake to do this. Remember? They said, yep but we can't take them. 
because they were impacted as well. So my advice would be plan for these things, have them be part of your contingency plan, no question about it, but don't stop with one place. This is this goes to plan B, plan C that I mentioned is to maybe have a series of institutions so that hopefully one of them will come through, maybe be less impacted by the crisis. Um, uh, otherwise you may be left uh, counting on something that is not going to be followed through. Thank you, John. Carrie. Our next question is for Casey. Can you talk about who in the facility communicates with local law enforcement to facilitate access and what that process looks like? Sure. So for our facility, like I said, we try to have that centralized communications team. Uh, the person or group of people that are reaching out to local law enforcement may be either one of the, the director for the facility, one of the associate directors for the facility, including the chief operations officer, or someone from our crisis management team from our Tulane University's main campus. So there's a whole group of people, we're lucky enough to be at an institution, large enough to have a whole group of people that this is their job is planning for these types of emergencies. Um, at smaller institutions, I'd really recommend establishing who would be responsible for that before it comes to that point. For us, we are lucky enough that that is already established for us by the university. You do regular um, check-ins at intervals to maintain the relationship and open communication? Yes, and we do tabletop exercises for certain components of our program, uh, particularly as it relates to our high containment facilities, our ABSL3 facilities, where we will not only reach out to them to maintain that communication, but have them on site with us to go through different scenarios and how would we each address different parts of those scenarios. And those are really eye-opening opportunities if you've never experienced that before, bringing people in from completely outside that have very different ways of looking at any particular um, event as it occurs and the different focus that different groups have. I, I would highly recommend that. Thank you. Um, I have one from Mr. Benson. Uh, does AI come into play in IoT and operational technology systems? In other words, uh, how is AI changing the landscape? Uh, yeah, with, without a doubt. So if you picture that that diagram, the uh, what I was calling the jazz hands diagram of the IoT data pipeline, I, AI could come into play in any of those places. You know, certainly on the analysis side to the right, AI is going to be a player, but AI will also be a player not, not in all systems yet but it's it's coming i believe on that toward that left hand side when you're managing all those devices because that becomes a lot of work to do when you got thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices so ai will be a play in there and then ai will be a play in the middle part too with the data management uh so so you know ai will be in this game just to, across the board all right thank you carrie is the annual review of con the contingency plan once every calendar year or once every 365 days? So for example, can you do it on the 31st of one year and then January 1st, the next? That's for open to anybody that might know. Is, um, go ahead, Greg. <laughs> Uh, my interpretation was annual was 365 days from its previous review. Um, but that I would get the official ruling from the USDA on that, what they consider. Yeah, I think that's probably the safest interpretation. Uh, don't push the envelope. Uh, there's probably little value in doing that. And you don't want to leave yourself vulnerable to perhaps a citation for not meeting the annual. So I think Greg's philosophy is a, is the safe one. I don't know if the USDA representative is still online. If he would like to comment. Yeah, it's it's once a year is every 365 days. Once a year. So every 365 days. Yes. Annually. Except for leap year. No, I'm just <laughs> All right, thank you. 
<laughs> okay, this is for anyone. Um, can you elaborate on how the USDA contingency rule has specifically impacted your contingency planning efforts in terms of either effort, staffing, or resources? Uh, yeah, so this is uh, Oliver Garden Dean. Um, it hasn't, because we were doing it all anyway, to be honest. I mean, that's a very, it sounds like a flippant answer. It's not meant to be. Uh, we invest a lot of effort, time, resources in disaster planning, and it was all happening to begin with. So in our specific example, it hasn't, if I'm being honest, it was happening anyway. Greg, maybe you want to comment on smaller companies you know, not the complex organizations who had other um, drivers for the contingency planning. Yeah, so that, that makes it a little more difficult of who, who does it. So um, it's, it is often um, for the internal animal care thing, it's the supervisor of the facility has a lot of input or often there's an attending vet that will have comments and things like that. And then the building part is usually done by facility manager and so. Has the contingency plan helped make that clearer or is it additive? It, uh, I think, like I said earlier, it was any discussion on the matter really helps and makes things clearer. So um, I, I think it, it, it's helped people prepare so they look at things and 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 do it. So the facility supervisor gets smarter and thinks about things, or 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 buys some extra stuff, or or you know secures racks to the wall in an earthquake zone area. Thank you, um, Carrie. Our next question, I believe, is for Dr. Hess. Um, when searching the NFPA sixteen hundred, it looks like the information is for purchase. Is that correct, or is there a free source? Um, you can create a uh, a free account and get access to the document um, online only. You can't download it without paying uh, for, for the product. But you can have access to it for free for a limited amount of time. I don't recall what the length of time is. Thank you. This is for any of the panelists. What are the common mistakes? What are some of the common mistakes to avoid when updating a contingency plan? I'd say first and foremost, not updating the plan. So hitting that review point and not I, just rubber stamping it, not going through the effort of seeing what really needs to be reviewed. Uh, if you have changes in personnel, that's actually one of the really easy things to overlook, even though everybody knows that that person has changed, that contact information that may be written next to biosafety officer may be different than the contact information that is for the current biosafety officer. So hitting those details in that plan. Excellent point. Great. I'd say be reasonably inclusive of people. Um, include people from the maintenance department, maybe even security and things like that, to bring in different perspectives and resources or things that are available that you might not be aware of. Oliver? I was just going to echo those points. We uh, regularly update our contact list, for example. People do change and, you know, the workforce is in flux at times. And, and uh, we are very particular about making sure every year, and in fact, this is enforced by our Office of Emergency Planning, that all of our contact details and personnel are, are current and uh, up to date. The beginning of the hurricane season often is a prompt, a, a, a temporal prompt to do that. And I would just, I would just add that um, there, there are routine changes like we talked about with personnel. Um, Another routine change could be when you have a change in equipment or equipment uh, 
suppliers or things like that that might change. But some of your most significant changes to your plan will come in after exercising the plan and then evaluating how that exercise went and what some of the uh, problems that you ran into during that exercise, whether it was a tabletop exercise or or other. Any others? Thanks, Carrie. If the contact information is all that has changed when the plan is reviewed, do you still retrain your whole staff within 30 days? Yes, this is Dr. Deepin Sentit again. So so the, the regulation says any substantive changes to the to the plan require training. So so again, only if there's a substantive change, but this do we require the retraining. Thank you. And this is for Mr. Benson. Uh, can you elaborate on how to incorporate IoT into tabletop exercises and who is included in these exercises? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. We, well, first of all, there's, with, with cyber events now, it's, it's increasingly, it's not uncommon for there to be a, a physical side and a cyber side. So we're doing more work, for example, with facilities. I'm in central, I'm in the uh, I'm a director of security operations in the Office of Information Security within our central IT group, and we're doing more work with facilities to go through exercises. Where we say, okay, uh, in fact, we just did one yesterday. The uh, the servers that control these door access points across campus we have been have been hacked, and there's a protest going on on the outside. How how are we going to handle this? So, so we do get the, you know, depending on the goal of the exercise, but frequently they're all combined. Um, but what we'll have a, a central IT group, certainly my group in the Office of Information Security uh, Facilities as an example. And then sometimes it will have some of the academic departments. So we, we, we do reach out broadly to, to do, to run those exercises. I will, I will throw in a thing. I, I, I won't drop the name because we're still looking at it. There are companies that do uh, crisis simulation, and particularly in this in the cyber realm, and we're we're looking at one of those now because we have to get to where uh, could the tabletops we've done before we've written them up, we've rehearsed them, you know, and they, you know, gone okay, but it takes some time. But we're trying to get to where we can do these. I mean, I I want to get to a twice a month cadence uh, for us, uh, and we we just got to be able to do the preparation and evaluation sooner. Um, you. Terry? What types of inter-institutional agreements may be needed to supplement organizational efforts and resources during large-scale or complex incidents? Who should be involved in establishing these agreements and how often should they be updated? Okay, I guess I'll go back to speaking to that one. So, Whoever is typically involved in establishing interinstitutional agreements at your facility is who you should involve. This may change with different types of facilities. For us, I know that we need our AV involved. If there are logistical issues to consider, I want to bring in our senior management staff or our animal care team to see, is this feasible? Is this not feasible? What types of supplies would we need? Do I need to bring in our procurement specialist to see if we need to do special ordering? But for the agreement itself, the AV, the IACUC, if it involves anything that has to do with the animals, and our general counsel, because for our institutions, at least, the lawyers need to be involved. Uh, we have to make sure that we are doing things in accordance with what they feel is acceptable um, as risk for the university as a whole. So I'd say at least those three main groups, someone from animal care, someone from IACUC, and someone from general counsel to be involved in developing those interinstitutional agreements from both sides. Anybody else want to add, John? Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Um, there's a lot of detail. So if, if we have an institutional agreement, for example, to uh, I'm going to send animals to another institution during the crisis. Um, <laughs> Clarifying things like animal ownership, animal responsibility, who's responsible for veterinary care, who's responsible for daily care, 
um, can Institution A have access to animals while they're at Institution B? There's all sorts of details. And so I think uh, Casey's advice is sound. The veterinary staff, the IACUC leadership and IACUC office, um, general counsel, if especially if it's a legal document between the two institutions, and probably the I.O. is the only additional person I'd throw in there. Thank you. Um, I think Casey's the one who brought up after action review, but I think this question could be for any of the panelists. And one has that after action review led to an improvement in your contingency plan or your program. Does anybody have any examples? Well, I'm not at a research institution, so I can't give an example, but I would say it should, a good exercise will reveal areas that need improvement every time. So if you're doing the exercises correctly, there should be improvement uh, to be found. So you're talking about tabletop exercises that might show a weakness? Tabletop exercise or functional exercise, whatever you're doing, yes, correct. Any other comments? Sure. So for some of the after actions that we've done in the past, and this was this was even well before this contingency rule, um, when we're looking at our disaster plans and how to improve, uh, things came up that were really simple sometimes, like how to transport feed from one building to another if it is raining outside to make sure that the feed does not get wet. Um, how are personnel moving from one place to another? What areas would they be staying in? Um, if power goes out in certain areas, what is, what's the plan B, right? So here's our plan A's, what's our plan B's? So a lot of those types of things have come up in our after, in our after action reviews. Thank you. Uh, I would, I would, as I think about, it, I was just thinking back to our our own disaster plan, and we we did not have a concrete element of that plan that said, "Here's what an after action analysis looks like, and here's what we're going to do: A, B, C, D, and E." It did not look like that, um, in part because I think that depends on whether it's a tabletop exercise or an actual event, and the the individual crisis may change dramatically the analysis of that crisis after the fact. So rather than scripting out a very specific thing you'll do after a table talk exercise or a crisis, I would recommend just including that in your in your management plan that it will be done by some means in a certain period of time. Uh, because you're absolutely right. Every time something happens, you learn what worked and what didn't. And forcing yourself to sort of step back and analyze that is probably a good thing. But scripting that out is probably impossible. Thanks. Um, Carrie. Oh. I was just going to say one of the aspects that we are aware of is the human aspect. You know, the, the uh, possibility of members of our community not having fuel or electricity themselves. And in certain cases, us having to take a very compassionate view in supporting them through a personal crisis of their own because their homes have been you know, destroyed or, or without uh, basic necessities. So that has become more apparent to us over the years that we sometimes have to serve in a, you know, a place of shelter for members of our community, students and staff, and sometimes faculty as well. Thank you. Um, Carrie. The next question is for anybody. Were there any unexpected benefits or drawbacks from the USDA contingency rule on your contingency planning processes? Institutions that I've been associated with have been ALAC accredited and, and following the guide um, for years. So much like Dr. Garden mentioned, this the contingency rule didn't dramatically change our approach to disaster management. We had most of that in place at the various institutions that I've worked for. I will say though, it's garnered a lot of attention today, the requirement for training within 30 days of hiring a new employee really put a wrench in our gears um, to address how we were going to accomplish that so that we were compliant 
with the with the rule, um, yet practical in 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 trying to onboard somebody and then expect them to be conversant in the disaster plan. We thought was probably unrealistic. So we do training, but for that new employee, it's an abbreviated training. That took a lot of time to sort of work through that, figure out how to do that, figure out a way to document reliably that we were doing that so that the VMO would be satisfied when the inspection process occurred. So that 30 day thing that we've all been talking about all day really was something that was not part of our previous plan that we had to incorporate. And that was a challenge. Anybody else want to comment? Okay, so this also is for everybody. Do you have a definition of success for your contingency plan? When do you know this is what we want? If it works. <laughs> I, I would say you don't ever, you don't ever reach the plan is never done. Um, the planning process is never done. It's it's ongoing, and that's why I think the the rule is is made the way it is uh, to be you know continually reviewed. Um, but success is is just keeping at it, um, doing it trying to do it well and not just do it so that you can check it off and say, well, we did that and it was the same as last year and there really wasn't anything different. Um, you're not you're not utilizing it appropriately if that's what's happening in my opinion. On the, and I'd comment from the on the uh, cybersecurity side, a, a phrase that's come up with, with us is that we're trying to build a culture of exercise, which which is just that idea. Like we we exercise, and it, like you don't nail it, but we want to get good at exercising, and that speaks to that repetitive nature. Thank you. I, I would also say success incorporates celebrating the wins, right? I mean, also thanking people in various different ways, not only uh, financial, but just recognizing and acknowledging the Herculean efforts that are sometimes involved in in navigating these, these disasters, what, whatever they may be. Okay. Carrie, do you have any other questions? Uh, one more for anyone. How do you prioritize when and where to deploy staff and resources during large scale or extended events? Well, it's sort of you, you you triage your situation and then you go accordingly. Um, if you look like there's going to be building flooding coming, you get stuff out of the basement, food, animals, and things like that. So um, you, you just have to kind of go with the flow. It's it's you, You've made plans and then you execute what you can as things will need. And actually, you'll get some brilliant ideas by people of what to do and what's next. So listen to people as much as tell people what to do. Because, you know, when we had a hurricane come through, a superstorm Sandy, all our food was stored in the basement. And someone said, hey, shouldn't we pull some of it up just in case? And that wasn't on our list. Uh, we pulled it up and it wasn't a problem, but it, was, it wasn't on our list to do. But at the time it came to effect, so. I agree with Greg. I think it's very hard to be prescriptive about ahead of time about what, how you're going to deploy resources, people, funds, uh, supplies. Um, that's sort of what I meant by establish priorities, goals that you want to achieve with your with your contingency plan um, in priority and rank order. So number one, personnel safety. Number two, animal welfare. And those goals will drive your decision making um, through a variety of scenarios. So they won't be scenario specific. They're institutional goal oriented, your, your values, what you think is important. So that whether it's a tornado or a hurricane or an HVAC failure, you can say, okay, 
In this case, we're not so worried about personnel. Personnel are okay. So next on the list is animal welfare. How are we gonna deal with that? That will help you decide where to put your resources. And it varies with each crisis and, and they're all unique. And I would add and, that, oh, sorry. You can go ahead. I I would add that one of the tenets for, for anybody that's going to try to help a situation instead of be helped in a situation is that you've got to have a, a personal or family preparedness plan. It's got to be part of, of um, that should be part of the organization's contingency plan. It's for the employees to have that personal plan. They'll be much more likely if they have that plan uh, in place to be available to assist. So as far as what what individuals you deploy or activate, uh, it's going to depend on who's available, um, but they'll be more likely available if they are prepared personally. And that goes right into what I was going to mention again, that um, having personnel know ahead of time who will be expected to be on site during certain situations if they can be available. That helps them prepare so that they are available to be on site. And when determining which resources in personnel to put in which places, if you have the benefit of having personnel that have been at your facility for many, many years and have been through similar situations in the past, and can have them on your first team so that they can help the newer individuals get through that. And, you know, don't panic. This is how we handle this and, and moving on through all of the steps. I think that that really helps. Well, thank you. I'd like to um, sort of wind it down. Thank all the panelists for your involvement and for everyone who submitted questions for Carrie for co-moderating the session for, with me. And now I'm going to turn it over to Susan um, to wind us down. Okay, so um, thank you for that wonderful session. Um, well, I'll wrap, um, we're wrapping up the day one of the workshop and uh, to remind everybody, we started the day with a presentation by the USDA and heard some of the different factors that led to implementation of the contingency rule. We also learned about inspection findings and citations that have been issued since the rule went into effect and how these trends compare to other new initiatives and requirements that have been adopted in the past. This was followed by the presentation of data from two national surveys that were conducted independently by FASIB and the workshop committee, which provided a high level overview of stakeholders' perspectives and experiences since the rule became effective. Some interesting trends were identified that showed efforts have been mixed and some components have been more challenging or labor intense than others, specifically plan development and training programs. This afternoon, we heard from a panel of distinguished experts who demonstrated how the approach to contingency planning varies depending on a person's role in the organization, the type of research that's conducted, the size and complexity of the institution and the workforce or population that's involved. Several key points were emphasized that included being forever prepared because things don't always go according to plan, making sure to set priorities in advance so staff can be nimble and confident making decisions when the unexpected occurs, establishing strong partnerships and support networks that include other research organizations, as well as your local, state, and federal authorities, participating in preparedness exercises that facilitate cross-training and information sharing, the importance of clear and accurate messaging during a crisis, and having multiple options for communication that are effective and ready to deploy when an event is in progress, and we were also exposed to some new technologies that are rapidly evolving and their vulnerabilities that will definitely change the way we define and manage emergencies in the future. So I personally am very grateful to each of today's speakers. You're all respected experts and we sincerely appreciate your willingness to share your time and expertise with us today. 
And I'd also like to thank our virtual audience for their attention and thoughtful questions and comments that you've provided throughout the day. That type of feedback is extremely important to what we're trying to accomplish, and it helps to validate the feedback that we'll be providing in the proceedings that are prepared at the conclusion of this workshop. So with that said, please make sure to join us again tomorrow for day two of the workshop. We'll be continuing these discussions by hearing how various members of the animal program participate in the contingency planning process, followed by a session dedicated to educational programs that I know you do not want to miss. So with that, thank you.